I'd like to welcome everyone again to the third lecture of the hematology series in preparation for the pants for the pan ray. The first two lectures can be found on our YouTube page by searching for paboardreview.org. My name is Wesley Norwood and I'm your host and I'm part of Joe Gilboy's PA Board Review team where we practice and teach evidence-based learning. This lecture in hematology became longer than I had anticipated but I believe the content is important so it has been broken down into three parts in lecture three and they will be posted in sequence. In this lecture we will review the pathophysiology associated with those questions most likely to be asked during the pants or pan ray examination. Hematology only comprises about 3% of the examination, but we were going in depth because of the importance that hematology and the vascular system plays in all the other um, organ systems. If you think about it, no cell in your body is more than a two cell distance, so there's no more than two cells away from a capillary. When you begin to wrap your mind around that and understand that, you begin to really understand how this affects everything else. A quick review of the homeostasis that is in place. We're going to view the, review the extrinsic and intrinsic pathways. So as we said before, the liver supplies a constant supply of inactivated coagulation factors that are ubiquitous in the bloodstream. Endothelial cells serve a lot of purposes. Um, some of them are to decrease friction. They're also biologically active, releasing products to keep clotting under control. The GI tract is responsible for absorbing vitamins and nutrients. Some of the important ones that we've mentioned are B12, folic acid, we'll talk about iron, and many more. The kidneys can release EPO in order to increase the red blood cell production in the bone marrow. To get a better understanding or a more in-depth look at this please see our second lecture. Blood flow decreases the probability of inactivated factors interacting with one another. Inactivated platelets and red blood cells are also ubiquitous to the circulatory system. So, every day our circulatory system experiences thousands of microtraumas due to activities of daily living every day. The analogy that I heard that I really like is eating a bag of Cheetos. So you, you chew the Cheetos, they're still a little rough, peristalsis takes it down your esophagus, some trauma is incurred during that. Well, what happens? Well, the endothelial cells, um, there's an insult incurred, the connective tissue is exposed, product is released. What happens? It causes the smooth muscles surrounding that area to spasm and that decreases blood flow. In order to repair and maintain homeostasis, a circulatory system has a number of ways to deal with these insults. The intrinsic and extrinsic pathways are part of the system. Repair is designed to stay isolated to the site of injury and not cascade out of control into other areas. So what happens is the damaged endothelial cells and the adjacent endothelial cells will release a platelet adhesion protein and we call that platelet adhesion protein von Wildermann's factor after the doctor who discovered it and what happens is that special adhesion protein has hooks for inactivated platelets so inactivated platelets will be able to stick to that that brings us to our the first question what is the most common hereditary bleeding disorder well <laughs> you guessed it it's uh, von Wildermann's factor and what happens is there's three types type 1 is the most common, 2 and 3 are the most severe but what happens is there's a genetic defect in creating the von Wildermann's factor so what's prolonged? well because the proteins will be affected the bleeding time will be prolonged and because this is part of the intrinsic pathway the PTT will be prolonged there will be no increase or problem with the PT now a note must be made that there's also von Wildermann factor circulating in the plasma and it does a few things like it preserves uh, factor 8 and does a couple other things so it's not only this primary platelet plug but other things that are affected uh, along with this so the treatment um, 
four von Wildebrand's factor is desmopressin, which increases um, factor eight and also von Wildebrand factor. So next what happens is there are vesicles within the platelets that release granules. These granules contain things such as serotonin, ADP, and calcium ions. ADP activates platelets. They cause them to become sticky, create these hooks so that they can stick to the platelets that had already adhered to the insult. So this is where some of the drugs come into play. They prevent the activation of the, of the platelets. Aspirin being one of them, Plavix, Clopidogrel, and when platelets are involved, then bleeding time will increase. So if you want to test the platelet function, you order a bleeding time. So some of the times you might see on a test question INR. INR is a combination of both PT and PTT, and the normal range is between two and three. So then, so then more platelets are able to come and stick to the first layer, this is called platelet aggregation. It's called the primary platelet plug. So this is where it becomes a little tricky. So as we said before, the liver releases inactivated coagulation factors. The platelets that had adhered in the primary insult are the catalysts for the activation of these factors. So if you kind of look at these, you know, seven becomes activated, 11 becomes activated. I think the ones to focus in on are Calcium is very important. Factor eight is very important, especially in the activation of 10 and thrombin. Now, 10 and thrombin and fibrin and fibrinogen, fibrinogen, which we'll see in the next slide, are common in the, both the extrinsic and the intrinsic pathways. So when you talk about the intrinsic pathway, we talked about PTT. Joe likens this to anything given IV or sub-Q, like heparin streptokinase, urokinase, they work on the vitamin K, but we'll talk about that in a minute. So like we said before, calcium factor eight, platelets are important in activating factor 10, prothrombin becomes thrombin. So what that does is it activates fibrinogen to become fibrin, which then creates strands to form a stronger plug. And this is called a secondary platelet plug. I like to think is the, the fi of the fibrin, like rebarb and concrete, causes to become stronger and resistant to um, shearing forces and trauma. Please see the next video, three of three, to continue lecture three of the hematology series.